So thanks for coming out. Um, we're just going to do a working lunch today. My name is Molly Martin, and I'm with New America. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about what New America is shortly. But like I said, this is a, a working lunch, a casual conversation. I don't know if I'll be able to close that. Can you guys hear okay? Um, about the future of work and the creative economy. We're going to do a couple of these conversations out this way, and we thought we would start with a, a brain trust of people who could help us think through what the assets are in makers, in creative economies, um, in some of the craft manufacturing scenes in this region. And by the region, um, I certainly mean Pittsburgh, but I also mean Morgantown, and I mean some of the rural communities and outer rings. Um, that are impacted in this in this economy, and we're going to talk a little bit. And I think that's Sabrina. Hey, welcome, thanks for being you. here. You're welcome. Thanks for. We're going to talk a little bit today about some of the the data that lets us know that creatives and the makers are so vital to the growth of the economy, and especially in a place like West Virginia, um, and definitely in a place like the outer ring suburbs of Pittsburgh. But I'm also here to learn from all of you. Um, before we get started on that. On our places, we each have an index card, and I scattered some markers. I would love for you to write your first name and the last thing that you made. And we're going to go around and get a sense of who's around the table before we order our lunch. So what's the last thing that you made? You could have made it for fun. You could have made it for, for cash. You could have made it for family. So while we come around and do our introductions, um, we'll come around and get some drink orders, so don't be shy. We're not too formal. Uh, I'll start to do a little modeling. So I'm going to tell you who I am, last thing I made, I'm going to throw in where I'm from, and I'd love to hear the same from you. So I'm Molly. I'm Molly Martin. The last thing I made was a pumpkin pie. It was okay. And I'm originally from Charleston, West Virginia, and I've lived in Indianapolis for almost 20 years. I'm Chip. Uh, the last thing I made actually was French onion soup, but it's kind of the season for cooking. I, uh, the last thing notable that I made was a Bluetooth amplifier for my uh, AV system. That's amazing. I'm from the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. So Please do. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Jess. I am from Charleston, West Virginia. And the last thing, I kind of put two things because I thought one was boring, but I'll mention it because I think it's important. Um, the last fun thing I made was like a sticker of a black bear illustration that I did. But the thing I made this morning is um, a dashboard driving the next action for a sales team for one of my clients. And I think creatives can contribute a lot to like moving things forward. So that's why I mentioned that one. I'm Maggie, I'm from the West Virginia area, and the last thing that I made is an infographic and some blog content for work and for personal reasons. Excellent. Let's come on down to this side. Did Kinsey? Sure. I'm Kinsey. I'm from Charleston, too, um, but just moved to Morgantown to take a new job. Um, I am holiday decorations were the last thing that I made. It was like a various assortment of them. I got wow. them dubbed as the office like holiday party helpers. <laughs> so did you like knit them? Did you? No, it was like lots of paper and glitter. Yeah, I used to be an early elementary teacher, so it just never left me. Yeah. Fantastic. And welcome. Ani, I will let you in. <laughs> Any place you're comfortable, here, there, anywhere? Thank you. Okay, uh, yes, please. I'm, yes. Uh, I'm Sarah. Uh, I am from Texas originally. Where, which part of Texas? Oh, it gets complicated. 
I'm from Fort Worth. So okay, I, I grew up in Houston. My family's from Austin. Mm -hmm. okay. I lived there a long time because I'm an adopted West Virginian. Um, I live here in Morgantown. Work at a company called Downstream Strategies. Uh, I'm a serial crafter, so really I have like three almost finished projects, but the one I will mention is a uh, 18 by 24 very colorful drawing of a rooster that is a commission piece for a friend that has been waiting for a very long time. That's very cool. Long time. So you're a print maker. I'm a pr I'm, I wear a lot of hats. Wear a lot of hats. I do a lot Lots of visual and serial physical art. Yeah. Serial crafter. Tell me your name again. I'm sorry. Sarah. I Sarah. We'll come on down to the end. <laughs> so while Sabrina's ordering, hi, I'm Stacy. Um, I'm originally from Fairmont, West Virginia. Went to West Virginia University for undergraduate school in art minor. And um, I currently work in Pittsburgh um, for a program called Startable, it's an entrepreneurship and maker program. And the last thing I made was a headstone for a hamster. Our oh. <laughs> hamster died on Thanksgiving. So. Oh, R.I.P. Um, what was the hamster's name? Kitty. Oh, Kitty. Oh, yes. I like that. Yeah, she's a big guinea pig. She's a big hamster. Um, yeah, so, you know. Lots of years. Lots of years. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I have a little one that's always tough. That was it the first time that they've lost a pet? Um, yeah. Yeah. We've lost people, and this seems to hit them harder. Oh. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> yeah. um, well, understanding that more. So. How about a um, So, Sabrina, I'll come back to you for your introduction. Hi, thanks. I grew up in uh, McDowell County in a place called Spring Branch Holler. And uh, what I wrote down that I created and I've been working on this, trying to get this published, is a memoir of how I met from the holler and made it to Capitol Hill a few years ago. Now I started talking about my truth and it threw me okay, into politics. Um, right. <laughs> it's I a world that. I didn't really know existed, so. Wonderful. So I think what we're doing is we're going around and we're saying who we are, um, where we're from, um, both geographically and organizationally, and then also the last thing we made. Sure, yeah. I'm Ani Martinez, I'm the field director for the Remake Learning Network. Uh, serves about 12 counties, including down here in Morgantown, West Virginia. And the last thing I made was Lego Towers with my niece and nephew. Yeah. Oh, nice. How old are your niece and nephew? They are three and five. Oh, that's a perfect age for Legos. Well, I am really tickled um, by the assortment around the room. Has anybody ever seen the movie Clue? And nobody knows why they've been invited to a place and they're very worried about it, like something <laughs> terrible is going to happen to them. I, this might feel a little bit like that, but, but fear not. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about this series that New America has been doing. I'll tell you a little bit about what New America is first. Um, so New America, and this is actually in your teeny tiny slides. I have a funny um, artificial intelligence story about the teeniness of the slides. You'll get a digital packet. But New America is a civic platform. Um, we get people together to talk about public problems. We also do research. We do policy work. We uh, do solution design. We look at the way Americans are interacting in the digital age. Um, lots of journalism, so we add as, act as kind of a media hub. Now, my colleagues who are actually listening in, um, the big uh, voice in the sky, Lisa and Christina and Margaret. Um, Lisa and Christina are with the Ed Policy Team at New America and look at education and tech and open educational resources and the different ways we learn, the different ways children interact with technology. I came into this project from another corner of New America. Um, I work in uh, what we've called the National Network, what we'll soon call New America Local, and I look at how communities are solving problems. The different ways that people, whether they're in kind of a church basement or in the state house, are looking at the most intractable problems and making them um, either go away or kind of bend to their will. And so I play kind of a part journalistic role and a part advisor role. I go around and find the people who are solving the problems in interesting ways. I try to get them the spotlight they deserve. I try to get them to each other. Um, I try to help create learning networks around those. And I do most of this work in the context of people accessing income. We used to talk about it as accessing work. But at the end of the day, people need money, right? We understand that. Um, whether or not the, the capitalist structure suits us, who knows, different luncheon. But we know that people need income to support themselves and support their family. And we know that the ways that they can get income is really changing. It's especially changing in the places where I work. So I'm based in Indiana, but I do work in Indiana and Michigan and Arkansas, 
here in my native West Virginia, a little bit in Western New York. And what all of those places have in common, and I don't have to tell y'all this, is the economy has changed drastically in those places. Whether it's um, a resource like coal or steel changing and, and the way you process it changing or certainly resources run out. Uh, a lot of those places rely on manufacturing and that's changed those folks. And a lot of those places have an out-migration problem. And I'm here to tell the optimistic story. That's why I call together meetings like this one. Um, this has all been part, this is actually the third event in something called the Humanities and Tech Connected Conversation Series. We've been really lucky to have the Council of Remake Learning and um, Grable Foundation and Benedum Foundation to hear a little bit about the way you use humanities to get around these pernicious technological issues. We're testing the theory that humanities tools, art, music, literature, history, craft, um, can be harnessed to help us understand our local stories and be good citizens, but also that we have to understand them if we're gonna understand the way people access learning and work. We wanna get a deeper sense of our community, and in this digital age, when the tech tools get all of the attention, um, we wanna make sure that we're using them appropriately and in tandem. So before we jump into the really simply everybody loves data, we're gonna talk about some killer stats. Before we jump into that, Lisa asked me to pose a question to you, my colleague in DC, and it's a really important one. This whole series has been about humanities moments, and actually Lisa gave me something specific to say, and I wanna honor that, because um, I don't want to take credit for her beautiful words. Uh, what was it, that was, was there an art, a piece of craft, that stirred something in you, or caused you to challenge the status quo, or seek new answers? Um, Ken Burns, the documentary maker, has said that his, his humanities moment, that's what we call these, came when he heard lines from an historic speech given by a relatively young Lincoln um, that had haunted and inspired him. So there are those moments for all of us. You read a book, you see a film, you hear a song, you make something. And Lisa wants us to do this imagining because we want you to be thinking in an open-ended way about why being creative matters. But also, we want to help you think about what you want in the future. And we've got these videographers here from Steeltown Entertainment. I'm gonna break the fourth wall and welcome them um, who are teaching young people how to harness their creative skills and, and become filmmakers and videographers. But if we could either today or in the future, and I can send you the link, we want you to think about that humanities moment, that moment of inspiration. And we'd love to capture that with the help of Steeltown today, or um, I'll send you to a link at the Humanities Project where you could share your humanities moment. Um, we're gonna be coming back to that idea a couple times, but now I'm kind of taking back the, the proverbial mic and, and bringing us to this maker skills as future skills. When Lisa asked me to be part of this project, she asked me from the perspective of someone who's working a lot on artificial intelligence. That was most of what I was doing last year. How does AI change work? And should people in a place like West Virginia be really scared of that? Um, what I came around to, talking to Ani, talking to her colleague Ali, talking to lots of people in the region, was technology is a huge consideration in the way work happens in this region, but it's not the only consideration. And this is one of the places in the country where doing things old school may be a certain economic savior for us, where we need to get other states and communities thinking the way that West Virginia and Southern Pennsylvania think about making and creativity, because it could be the only answer for a lot of small communities. Um, so I'll go over these, I'll send these in a digital packet, but what I wanted to tell you is like from, a, from the perspective of future work, automation and technology are already here. The future of work is now, it's kind of past us out here, it is old news to tell someone that they might lose their job or that their job might change due to technology. And so I've got some statistics in here that I just wanted to share with you about kind of why communities are facing a challenge and why everybody's talking about the future of work. So the future of work is changing because the people are changing, the community needs are changing, the way we work is changing. And, and in this region, um, that means a couple things. So overall, in the, in the nation, we're tipping towards the white minority. That's one big thing that's changing about the way we work and interact. That's not bad news, that's actually a really big asset. What's challenging in this region is we're tipping towards a white minority in certain regions and not others, but meanwhile, nothing else we do is changing. We're not addressing systems that better educate the foreign born who do come to us, and a lot of them are coming to Southern Pennsylvania. We're not acknowledging the fact that the achievement and opportunity and educational gaps
for folks of color remain really pernicious, even in a place where so-called white poverty is probably the biggest marker. Um, so it's still important to know that we will be a majority minority, which is always such a weird expression, right? Uh, here before too long in, in 2050, even in a place like West Virginia that is more white than maybe the rest of the country, but certainly in Pennsylvania, where most of the population growth has been from foreign-born residents, um, which is a really exciting thing. But if our foreign-born residents don't have the same kind of opportunity, what are we doing? The other thing that's changing nationally and it impacts this region is People are not staying in jobs for a really long time like they used to. That is probably not news to y'all. But two out of three millennials are going to leave their job in the next three years. And I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm older than a millennial, but we think of millennials as being in high school. The oldest millennials are in their late 30s, right? And so the core of our workforce, a huge bunch of people, even in an aging place like West Virginia, but definitely in a, in a kind of more youthful area like Pittsburgh, folks are not going to stick with you if you're an employer for very long. We think of that as a sign of the times. Really, it's the new truth. It's just the constant. And we have to think about people as moving really fluidly through the ways that they're employed and the ways they make their money. Um, we're also working longer, which is great news for this region. So it's bad news for those of us who thought maybe someday we would retire. Um, but most of us are going to work into our 70s. And most of us are going to, at some point, work for ourselves into our 70s. In West Virginia, this is actually a really good narrative because West Virginia is a relatively old state. Per capita, the aging population really sticks because West Virginians aren't staying as much as they used to. We have a lot of out-migration in West Virginia and they're also not having as many kids as they used to and so there's just not as much youthful turnover. And the, the other reason we need to think about this both in um, the Pittsburgh Metro and Morgantown is for the folks who are staying, there's a huge group of them who are living in poverty in their best, quote, money-making years, in those early career years. And it's because traditional employment is really not suiting them. So technology certainly has changed the way people have worked. And I think a lot of people blame offshoring and technology for job loss. So I wanted to actually put that out to the group. How many of you know someone who's lost a job or had a job change, and they've told you it was technology or it was like offshoring, it was Mexico, it was China? Has anybody had that happen to someone in their lives? I see a mixed reaction. So, Stacy, did I get it? Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about what that story was like for the person you knew? Um, I don't know if my story is what you're looking for, but I, yeah, I was in New York during the Great Recession and mm -hmm. people's jobs were being offshore. Yeah. So, that story was, it was, it was interesting. It was, uh, I worked in a company, I worked in a in the corporate world after I graduated from art school, I got a corporate job, and my job was to um, transition processes to our Mumbai office. Okay. So it was literally my job to offer, offer jobs. Mm -hmm. So, sorry guys. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was a weird time, and it was a job that I got, and for my employees who were, who knew well in advance they were going to lose their jobs, you know, I helped, I helped them as much as I could, I prepped them with, you guys partnered up with our HR team to do, like, resume building. You know, during the Great Recession, that didn't matter so much, though. It was just, there was such a lack of jobs. Um, and, yeah, for them, some of them, it was sort of a, you know, they thought it was very anti-American. That was their narrative. Um, for others, they kind of understood. We were technology company. They understood that that's, this is the way everything was going, and they just figured they had to get used to it. So, um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting. And there's so many emotions attached when you're the person losing your job, right? It's so loaded. Absolutely. No, that's a really great story, and actually, it's a perfect jumping off point, because when we understand the story of what happens to someone in a job disruption or a job loss, we know a little bit more about what to do with it. So you were in New York, yeah. and I pres presumably like in New York City. Yeah, yeah. And so you were in a place where there's a little more inherent, perceived inherent opportunity once the economy bounces back, right? Do you think, sure. yeah, <laughs> do you think that the people who were, who, that you were working with, um, had any hope looking around thinking at least I'm in New York. Do you think it would have been a different experience having that conversation about moving everything to, to Mumbai I doubt if you were back here? I yeah. honestly doubt it. I mean I feel like that it's I feel like it's, that's a really that's a question of class too. Like the, mm -hmm. the people, you know, it's dependent on uh, you know where these people are coming from. These are these are born and raised New Yorkers who are coming from like a low lower class mm -hmm. um, backgrounds 
And so they felt, you know, sorry, we'll drew up in that. I don't think they felt like there were a bunch of opportunities. Like New York is looking pretty grand. There's real expensive to live there. Right. So, um, no, but yeah, I can't really compare it directly to a story about about here and what that would look like. But, you know. No, that's perfect because I think you've made the point is that it kind of does. We assume that living here, whatever here means, yeah. is somehow a a hit. You know, it's we're at a deficit. But if you don't have a post-secondary education, if you're already the lowest paid people in a company, it kind of doesn't matter where you live when the future of work kind of comes knocking. Um, what matters is the resilience, and resilience has been a real privilege in this country. It comes with money and it comes with class, um, and often comes with race too. So I think that's a really pertinent story. Hi, welcome, how are Thank you? Thank you so much, apologize for being late. Do not apologize. And you must be Donna. I am. I'm so You're glad all. to meet you. I am. Nice to meet um, you. So Donna, I wanted to just, everyone, this is Donna. Donna, this is everyone. Uh, we were just going over some statistics about the future of work and how they relate nationally and, and how they relate to the region. And Stacy was sharing a story of, of having worked in, in New York when a lot of offshoring was going on at tech companies um, there uh, during the Great Recession. Now, when we think about why people get displaced now in a tight labor market, it feels like it would be a different story, but it usually isn't. It means that the jobs change enough that they need folks with what they call higher order skills, right? I don't love the language of middle and higher skills, but it's the language they use. And all of a sudden, there are a lot more jobs available, quote, up here, and the number of jobs down here start to go away. But you have the same number of people trying to get through that door, the number of those jobs. Did, did anybody have a first job like at a McDonald's? Okay. So have <laughs> exactly. Retail. Retail. Those used to be our way in, our way to get work experience and all the critical thinking skills and problem solving skills, and also the way to start a little bit of social capital networking. Those jobs anymore are being, quote, taken by older people. We need, adults need those jobs, and so it's not a summer job or an entry level job more anymore. And there are fewer and fewer jobs with places like McDonald's going cashierless by 2020 for the people who really need that leg in the door, especially youth employment. And so we're up against this weird moment where people are being told, you need all these higher order skills to compete, but you're not gonna be able to work when you're a teenager because youth employment is way down, sorry for your luck. You need those higher order skills, but it's really expensive to get a post-secondary education. Um, we're also getting to the point where skills that, the jobs that used to be held by the folks who did not get to have education beyond high school are thinning out. And so we're gonna do a little exercise. Um, I've got a little list on my teeny tiny slides that I will read um, of some jobs. And so let's do, a little, let's do a little game. The jobs are CEO, you'll flip over and see them, aerospace engineer, preschool teacher, accountant, choreographer, cashier, and admin assistant. Who wants to take a stab at the least vulnerable job on that list to automation. What do you think a robot can't do? Where is AI not, not playing? Yes, Jeff. Preschool teacher. Preschool teacher. That's exactly right. Like, obviously, we're not fortune tellers, but data shows us we don't want to give our babies to robots. It's a thing we don't like. Um, it reminds <laughs> some of the older of us, like me, of the Jetsons. Um, what's another really vulnerable job? Who's on the block that's on this list? Cashier's a big one. Cashier's a big one. We'll talk in a minute about just how many cashiers are in this region. Um, cashiers are just dying to become creatives, you know? And there's a, there are actually two more on this list that I would say are super vulnerable. Is accountant? Accountant is really vulnerable, Donna. That's a good one. And it is one of the better paying jobs that we're seeing collapse because the entry level accounting is kind of rote. Um, we have a lot of apps that do things for us. And, and in that kind of accounting category for labor statistics, you also have things like insurance adjusters. It's not a good time to go into insurance adjusting. How many of you ever pointed your phone at the car after you've had an accident, right? Um, so it is these jobs that once guaranteed you a middle class living that are starting to collapse a little. And then finally, administrative assistant, which is really bad news uh, for women. And it tends to be bad news for women in places like Pittsburgh. Real bad news for women in South Bend, Indiana, Indianapolis, Phoenix, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, um, where you have some history of racial segregation in all those cities. You have a strong history of women of color 
being unable to get jobs in certain fields, but having an in into the administrative assistant thing. So not only do you have women at risk, you also have some pretty heavy racial and class implications when an administrative assistant category collapses. But the skills that you need to do some of these jobs that are going away are still pretty relevant. Um, when we talk about automation, we often talk about high-risk skills. So it's, it's here, emotionless, predictable, rote. If you can build a hamburger, you can build a stack of pancakes, McDonald's can fill your soda with a machine. But there are human skills that, we, that robots just aren't good at. We've seen them do it. We've seen them compose music. We've seen them choreograph. But they're just using formula, so it's not very passionate. It doesn't show much judgment. It doesn't show many people skills. So you have working in settings that are unpredictable, things that require flexibility, judgment, strategy instead of rules, and dealing with people. And so those human skills are actually something that a cashier is probably really good at. So you worked retail? Did somebody say they worked? Okay. Yeah, so when you worked retail, how many times did you have to deal with an awful person? A lot. Right. And what did it teach you about knowing that all humanity, people? But like, well, no, humanity, when they shop, we <laughs> lose our ability to be people. Right. Yeah, it's wild. Right. It's really interesting how that just leaves you when you're into a store. And how much, did that strike you as a creative skill? Like when you were sitting there working retail, were you thinking, I'm building a skill? Um, in a way, yes, because I've watched my parents become entrepreneurs and have to build that skill, so that's the only reason I knew is because they told me, like, you're going to have to do this for the rest of your life. Right. Like, you're going to have to navigate people that do this and act this way for the rest of your life. Exactly. So like, the reason I knew that is because I had, like, parents who were not complaining to be like, stop, this is life, like, this is how it works. Right, yeah. right. And so we, we actually have people earning and developing skills that are probably the most future resilient in the lowest paid job. Mm -hmm. We don't value them that way, we don't pay them that way, but you've hit on it. The real issue when transitioning people from jobs that are going away into jobs that are resilient is making them see the value in skills like creativity and dealing with difficult people, but there often isn't a parent or an infrastructure, people try and pay their bills. They don't necessarily have time to stop and say, oh my, look at the resume that I'm building. And, and so in this, we know that job disruption due to automation is really not always as much about loss as it is about change and being able to translate those skills. So if you're flexible and adaptable and focusing on the transferable skills, you're actually gonna be okay even if you're a cashier today. But there's a whole lot of social infrastructure that has to grow up around that. And in a place like West Virginia, the infrastructure isn't always there, right? You know, if I'm in Pittsburgh, I have slightly better odds um, of building an infrastructure that can help a cashier make that transition because there's some committed market demand. There are employers moving to Pittsburgh. You've had population growth. Um, in West Virginia, it's, it's a largely out-migration state, like Indiana, where I live, and you have less committed corporate demand. So we can develop skills all day but there may not be any place for people to work. And that's why it's a pretty complex place to talk about transferability and probably an ideal place to talk about creativity. Um, um, I'll, oh, yes, please. Just real quick about population, though. Yeah. I think it's important to clarify that Pittsburgh hasn't grown at all. In fact, all we've done is stop gap the decline for the first time. That is such a good point. Years. Yeah, right. So tell me more about that. We talked a little bit, and you may, may have not been in the room, we talked about foreign-born population helping the Rust Belt stay above negative. What, why do you think Pittsburgh has been able to stop the, the hemorrhage of folks? Well, I was at the Allegheny Conference's annual meeting last night, and so it's fresh in my mind, awesome. is the idea of continuing to rely upon manufacturing and energy companies that kept us afloat, particularly in 2009. Mm -hmm. um, investments in universities, in medical hospitals and facilities, and in uh, mm -hmm. universities and robotics also helped contribute, and it took 35 years, right? Chip, do you know anything else, or anyone in the room know anything else to? Keep going, you're doing great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the political climates shifting in and out has really been sheltered in places like Pittsburgh because it is so uh, such a closed system. And it was actually the lack of flow, like a global mindset that saved us in a lot of ways, and it's only now that we're seeing that opening up being part of the future building possibilities. I think there's another <coughs> thing that I think is unique about Pittsburgh, and that is, well, the, you touch on it, the university systems. Mm -hmm. the, um, the philanthropic community is also a key element because right, the philanthropic community, rather than being 
a number of disparate uh, um, uh, foundations. They actually coordinate really, really well to be strategic in the way that they support uh, efforts. Um, and it makes a, an enormous difference in having lived in Texas and Oregon and a number of places. Uh, Pittsburgh's unique, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, and, uh, and I think there's, uh, so there's sort of a call that needs to go out to um, the non-government, um, philanthropic uh, folks in, to say, you, you should be thinking about not telling people what to do, but organizing yourselves around um, strategic goals and then letting, um, letting the other sectors, whether they're private or public sectors, respond in the ways that they know best or can best um, accomplish those strategic goals for the region or for the community. And, mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's uh, there's a lot of lessons that I think we all can learn from uh, from really sort of pulling apart those interesting ingredients that I think that's more unusual. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see glimpses of that because of the UN sustainability goals, mm -hmm. but it's very nascent, and Pittsburgh is actually unfortunately one of the front runners in doing that. Um, and corporations are leading the way in that, strangely. Mm -hmm. Corporations, and then education is the second sector that the UN is seeing. This is so perfect for this conversation because what Pittsburgh has done, to your point, if I'm, if I'm hearing correctly, this makes sense, has spun its deficits to its advantage, to its protection. Um, and, and obviously it's a really innovative place because I think when you are struggling to survive, you innovate. And so every city like Pittsburgh or South Bend or even Indianapolis to a much lesser extent finds that. So when we talk about the ways that Pittsburgh has been able to kind of stay afloat, it had to spin a narrative on its ear. For those of you who, and I know some of you in Pittsburgh also work in West Virginia, for those of you who work in West Virginia, how has an insular mindset served West Virginia? Is it, is it Jessica, <laughs> that meaningful glance. I don't know that it has a lot. I think it's, yeah. it's actually a detriment. Okay. If I had to say one thing that's been beneficial about it, I think it does build, I think we have a really strong sense of community here and belonging. Mm -hmm. And I think even people who have left still have a very strong connection to their home because of that. And so I think that could be a strength, mm -hmm. that just sort of idea of roots and pull. Mm -hmm. But I think in a lot of ways it can also be a hindrance if we're not careful about balancing that. Because I think we're also very... I've heard from a lot of people from out of state, like, yeah, people are really welcoming once you get to know them, but it takes so long to build connections because Interesting. people are um, just sort of standoffish at first. Like, there's, it's like you're walking into a, a high school cafeteria and there's all the cliques already, and then you have to figure out where you belong. It's not very open, is mm -hmm. what I've heard people say. So. That's really interesting. Donna, you look like maybe you had something to add, yeah. too. I think, you know, the resiliency is powerful in West Virginia. You know, I really do, and that's to build on what you're saying, I think. But um, there is that insular thing. Like, Maggie and I just put on a legislative forum, and we brought in, um, Benetton helped us sponsor it. And they're really big on uh, state, you know, in in state experts presenting as well as national perspective and that's the way we feel too in our board but we really got a lot of flack from some people like why would you bring in Carnegie Mellon when we're doing this this and this right. you know mm -hmm. so it that's a little discouraging you know that's a really great perspective yeah. uh, one thing I hear threading through all of this which I think is gonna be really pertinent to an activity we're gonna do together is Understanding, like the sense of identity is so strong in this region and in both Pittsburgh and, and West Virginia, that that is sometimes hard to penetrate, but also sometimes a useful tool to leverage. Um, and also, I, I take your point, Donna, you know, growing up and then moving into philanthropy, I worked at a foundation for a decade, a foundation called Lumina Foundation. And I remember I asked somebody, so if I wanted to go into philanthropy and go back home to West Virginia, and work in philanthropy in West Virginia, where would I go? And they said, well, you'd move to Pittsburgh. And I said, well, why, why wouldn't I get to be in West Virginia? And they said, it's, we, we often have to choose our battles in terms of where the money is and, and where the influence is and where helpful partners are, which can lead to some resentment right. when you go to some of the smaller communities and say, we got this, but, but the, the lack of infrastructure and support doesn't necessarily buoy that up. Um, 
you know, one thing, I, I don't think I'm telling anybody at this table things they don't know, but I know folks come from, come from different sectors. I didn't want to do a bit of a pivot back to the data just briefly to say what this, what this region has stacked against it yeah. is not something we can sneeze at. Higher than average national unemployment, especially in West Virginia, but certainly in Pittsburgh as well. Um, low labor force participation. So since 2015, West Virginia has more often than not had less than half of its working age population actually working. So that's an extraordinary distinction that sets it apart from the rest of the country. Um, now, Montgomery County has pretty high median income, so this is a little bit of a weird microcosm. But around you, you don't, right? And the median income in, in your highest places, like I think it's Berkeley and, and Montgomery, are still 10 to $15,000 lower than the national median. In Pittsburgh, the, income, the median income is lower than the, the national median. Um, in West Virginia, women 25 to 34 are their largest group living in poverty. So people in their prime working ages and people it, who want to be parents are unable to, to find any social mobility and sometimes social safety. And in Pittsburgh, you have, and this is no small thing, two to four times as many metal workers and forgers and casters as they have any place else in the country, including where I'm from. And that's weird, because out in Elkhart, Indiana, that's pretty much what they do, right? They make components, they make RVs, out in the Midwest they make cars, but Pittsburgh's got you beat. And, and those are some of the most vulnerable jobs. So we've just, we're on a lot of weird tenterhooks here. Um, and I, oh, finally, I wanted to point out that the jobs in West Virginia that are held by the most people, two out of three of them are among the most vulnerable. You have nurses, that's good, nice and resilient, lots of nurses in West Virginia. You have cashiers and you have truck drivers. And so you have vast swaths of people working in things that are kind of bad news. And when, you, when I send you the digital packet, if you, if you nerd out about that sort of thing, you'll look at the share of people. In your most urban parts of West Virginia and in Pittsburgh, you have one in three jobs at risk. But in your less developed, more depressed places in West Virginia, you have two and three jobs at risk. Risk of disruption, at risk of people not being able to, to stay steady uh, in that work. And, and again, um, sorry for the, the tiny print, that was an AI hiccup. Always pay attention to the aspect when you order a print. Um, you'll see that you have 20s of thousands of cashiers, 20s of thousands of administrative assistants, um, truck drivers, tens of thousands of truck drivers in West Virginia. And we don't know how that's gonna change, but we know it's going to change and it's going to change soon. Um, the educational attainment doesn't look so hot in either place. Um, Lumina Foundation would tell you that you want it to be at 60% by 2025. It's in the 40s um, in Pittsburgh, it's in the 50s in the broader metro area, it's in the 50s in Montgomery County, but in some parts of West Virginia it's in 17%. So you still are really far off from where you need to be because what we know is the people with the least education after high school and the people who earn the most are more likely to lose their job as the economy changes. So that's all the rain on the parade stuff. The good news is that there are major assets here. And one of the major assets is the cross-sector commitment to equitable attainment and mobility. I don't think I've ever seen a place better than the kind of Pittsburgh, Northern West Virginia region in talking about how education, private sector, philanthropy can work together to move people around. Um, you've got a lot of post-secondary innovation, so I'm really glad that the university folks are with us. Uh, West Virginia has always had to learn how to innovate to get people their education because it's just simply not been easy to get people to classes or to lay broadband and lay wire to get people their internet. Ani, you've talked about, and that's a great point, when people live in Pittsburgh, coming into like downtown Pittsburgh is something they may not do if they live in the outer ring. So getting them their education has always been a challenge and, and Pittsburgh institutions have done a good job. You have a lot of natural tourism, but you know this is the big finish, right? And this gets us to the, the meat of our activity. What you have in both places that is so valuable is a legacy of craft and artistry. Because what we know is more and more people are going to be contingent workers and working for themselves. That entrepreneurialism, if we craft it right, can be really especially good for women tend to be underpaid when they are not selling goods. Um, we also know that at the end of the day, there are certain things humans just like better when people do them. They like them to create something. They like to know that somebody has touched the rooster print. They like to know that somebody has blown the glass. They like to go to boutiques. 
while major retail collapses, small stores are actually doing okay because people like that experience. And so I want to actually um, stop nattering on and talk to Jessica for a minute. So we invited Jessica. Do you prefer Jess or Jessica? Either. Uh, we we um, invited Jess last, Jessica, very much on purpose. Because uh, she and I were talking about why investing in, making a bet on people going off on their own, pursuing creative fields might actually be really, really good for the West Virginia economy. Um, so I'd love to have you talk a little bit about what Savage Grant is, um, how we got started on this conversation, and why you were interested in coming here today. Yeah, so I work for, um, I, I always have a bit of a hard time explaining where I work because I like to say I just work for a guy. Um, <laughs> he, his name is Patrick, and he owns a company called Savage Grant. Um, but that company in and of itself is more of a holding company for other companies. And so his whole thing with Savage Grant is that he wants to drive entrepreneurship and innovation um, and use market-based solutions to solve the economic and social problems that we have in the area. And so um, I think one of the key tenets of any entrepreneur's understanding is that any problem is really just an opportunity, right? If you look at it the right way, if there's a problem, it means there's a need not being met, and so um, that's a business option. So that's kind of the premise of Savage Grant, and as a, as a part of that, um, he owns two companies in Huntington, and one based in Charlotte, but the Charlotte one is really committed to remote work and employs a lot of people from the West Virginia area remotely. Um, and uh, our goal is to, like I said, we have big problems. So one of the companies is really focused on clean water and infrastructure, which we see as being um, something that you know can't be outsourced. Somebody's not going to bring us our water or solve our water problems, our infrastructure problems. Um, the other is human capital development, and it's funny you mentioned the women thing. One of our biggest fo areas focuses on increasing the number of women working and finding mm -hmm. uh, options for uh, helping women work uh, to balance family and other um, issues alongside other jobs, and then um, bringing a tech community to this region. Um, and so uh, Central Lab, which is one of the, the companies that I think sort of best encompasses a lot of the ideas that we're talking about here, is a marketplace that connects companies across the US with tech talent working remotely from the Appalachian region. So you were talking about offshoring. We're going after the offshore people and saying like, look, like we're not gonna be able to compete with prices in India, but we're a heck of a lot more affordable than somebody in the Bay Area and you're gonna get a much better experience because you're not gonna have the time zone lags, you're not gonna have the language barriers, you're not gonna have some of the legal hurdles of sending data offshore. Um, so hire us, we're qualified, we're capable, you know, we're able to do this work and we'll still save you money in the long run. So um, that company has been targeting communities focused on are communities that have been severely affected by coal, the economic downturn in coal. And I was telling Molly, one of the interesting things to us was, um, when we first started, we kind of made the assumption that we would be attracting a lot of people, because we offer a lot of free training programs, um, who were unemployed or laid off coal miners. And what we found instead is that we're attracting a lot of coal miners' wives, um, which is mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and so we're actually beating, by far, the representation of women working in tech than most companies are. I think um, about 55% uh, of our um, membership in our what we call our talent exchange um, are women or who identify as women. And um, they love it because it offers flexible options. We let people set their own hours. Um, we let them set the number of hours they want to work. Uh, they can work from home. So women who often have a lot of duties like childcare or elder care are able to balance that um, with some of their other responsibilities. Um, and I think that in a lot of these communities, traditionally most of the economic opportunity has been focused on men, because a lot traditionally men or women are not going into the mines or into manufacturing jobs. Sometimes they do, but more often they don't. And so they're kind of hungry for that career development and that work opportunity. And so we've had a, a lot of women come to us um, and get this training and start working with us. Um, and I think that's really cool for a number of reasons. Um, one, I think it speaks to that sort of contingent and flexible workforce. Um, but I think what really attracted me personally to come here today is this intersection of creativity and technology because although I think we tend to see tech as being a replacement for jobs, 
I don't think that we will be successful as a society if we just turn everything over to the robots. Like she was mm -hmm. saying, like there are just some things that people want other people to do. They want to feel a connection, a belonging, a sense of community. When you think about the problems that are to be met in the world, so many of them relate to that sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like you want to feel safe, you want to feel connected, you want to feel loved, and that's not going to happen as much with uh, technology. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for creative people and makers to build those relationships. And the other thing is, when you talk a lot about AI, one of the things that we look at a lot is some of the ways that can go wrong. So we hear a lot about like AI bias. Um, my One of my coworkers' daughters, she's applying to go to MIT um, next fall. And she wrote an essay on the idea that, um, you know, true innovation does not happen based on um, robots. Right? Like machines are probably not going to innovate because what machines are really good at are looking at patterns and following the same procedure over and over or making connections between things that are common. But innovation happens when you take two things that seem disparate and pull them together and find a new solution. And so that's not something they're good at. And so she uses the example of um, uh, one of MIT's recent algorithms that they, they crafted. It returns um, the result of man is to computer, computer scientist as woman is to homemaker. Appalling, right? right. Like, but based on history, that's true. That's a fair observation when you take a look at you know 200 years of work in the country. But we're not going to move forward with things like that. So it has to be people driving that. It has to be creative thinkers. It has to be people who are good at understanding re relationships and empathy and, and human concerns. And so I think that's um, that's why I hate things. <laughs> that's fantastic. And, and so I heard a lot of things there, but I think you you have kind of brought together this sometimes cacophonous thing that gets us started in these meetings. We talk about the data and the sad stories, we talk about the personal stories and the sense of community, we talk about solutions, and what you said is our opportunity in this region is to make sure people understand the value of their own creativity yeah. and understand that it has value in the artisanry space, um, in the public innovation space, in the tech space, and that the, the one single thing is the value of the people, that this is a people-driven strategy. Um, so when people talk about future skills and the future of work, we tell everybody go to learn to code. And in this region, that has not gone so hot, right? And, and there's nothing wrong with coding, um, per se, but, but certainly the question, it begs the question, did anybody ask them if they wanted to be coders? And they just decided that was the best pathway. So Jessica, from your perspective and the work that you do, how do you break someone out of the mindset that to work in the future, you have to focus on tech, versus to work in the future, you have to have the sort of creative mindset that makes for a good tech designer? Like, how do you get around that? Yeah, so, well, one of the things I would say is that I would not recommend anybody to go learn to code um, at this point, because it's another thing that's, it's like a cashier. Like, computers have figured out how to code themselves. Um, most things are point and click at this point. Maybe they're, if you want to be like a really high level coder, sure, but if you're just trying to get you know, a paying job, I think that that's becoming very commoditized. But what computers still can't do is figure out what needs done, right? So what we tell our people when we're recruiting for these jobs is what we need are people who have a lot of common sense, who um, can relate to people who can communicate, who can translate, um, and who have a lot of empathy and understanding of what what the end game is and how you want to get there, and then how you can manipulate the technology to make that that happen. And so we always stress that technology is just a tool. You learn to use it just like you would learn to use a hammer um, or a, you know a drill or whatever. So we can teach you that part, but the being able to think part and the being able to come up with new solutions. Um, you know, that's a skill that you uniquely have. And I think that's one of the things that we've used a lot because I think there's a bias against women in technology and sometimes women feel like they don't belong. And we stress, like, you do this all day long. You problem solve, you balance, you know, priorities. You, um, you know, kind of figure out, okay, what do we really need to do? And that's all you're going to be doing in this role. They're a lot more comfortable. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, I would say, again, it, it's more on the, the creativity piece. Like, the coding piece is just another another repetitive task that can be done by a machine. Mm -hmm. So Ani, you at the Remake do a lot of work in making sure that kind of digital assets and technology and different ways of interacting with 
with learning assets are on the table. Mm -hmm. How do you get around this question? Like getting people comfortable with tech, but also preserving mm -hmm. the creative legacy, the creative thought, the human element. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's always a, in everything, a frustrating yes and, right? Like creativity, human skills, empathy, these are critical skills for, for the future, but you cannot be understated that numeracy, logic, statistics, algebraic, mathematics, and calculus are key elements. If you don't understand these things, it doesn't matter how creative you are or how good it is you're using to use the tool. If it breaks, you're effed, right? And there's not a lot of getting around that. And so it's a partnership of code and a partnership of other human beings that I think is increasingly important. So you need a salad of everyone, like a mix of healthy and robust skills who know how to work together. And oftentimes, culturally, the way that those people are sorted and sifted in early education practices, they're put on these different cultural tracks, and that's where we see a lot of seasons happening. We need to de or recouple how mathematicians are being taught the way artists are being taught, and really force them to work together, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point. Whenever I say, I would not say, Learn to code. Exactly. But learn, I completely agree. Learn with you. the thinking right. behind the coding, like uh, the math, yeah. the, the, those sort of core concepts. Absolutely. I think that's so important. Yeah. So. Yeah. I didn't mean to talk past you in that. No, sense, no. Yeah. I, I yeah. just you made me think about so. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, so numeracy, logic, math, spatial sets, creativity sounds like a maker to me. You're a visual artist. Do you think of yourself as a? Did anyone ever tell you you're really good logic, spatial sense? That's your thing, or did they? Put you into a very specific column and say you're an artist. You're being really creative. Example, because I'm very much well, not that I believe in left brain, right brain, but I'm both. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm an anomaly in that. <laughs> Which is amazing, and that's awesome. Do people, did people build? Did they tell you that? Did you always, did you have a lot of support around you saying this is a good thing? You're using both sides of your brain. You can. You, you're capable. You're both brained. You're amber brained. No. Yeah, you figured it out. Just did what I wanted to do and things that were good, and, and that I'm like, to me, it stems from curiosity. Curiosity is another important element. Sabrina, what about you? You're a curious person. You seem curious about everything. Yeah, I am. Um, did I people tell you you were creative? Well, that's not a word that people use. Uh, I'll tell you. I'll just try to summarize in a little package here things that people have said in the past and now. <laughs> Because uh, I'm very, I'm very curious. For some reason, no matter what has happened to me, I've always learned to learn, love to learn. So it's, it's been a miracle in itself. Of all the things I've had to go through. But um, when I was a kid, uh, I didn't know anybody who went to college. So with all this stuff that y'all are saying, like I'm coming from a whole, I'm coming from way behind the game here. Um, people at my church, my family, my teacher, starting in kindergarten said uh, she's smart. Now I didn't believe I was smart. I was born legally blind. People didn't know this so later on. I have contacts in. It's just a whole nother with processing issues going on here which has been a blessing as well the way I process information. It's very hard but I've learned to master it. Um, they said she's going to be the one to figure out how to solve these problems. They could see how I was thinking, and I was very quiet, but they could see it. They watched me, and they said she's going to be the one to go to college. There's no colleges in Miguel County. So I didn't know what college was. They said it. I believed it. I'm the first and only person in my family to graduate from high school. My life is so hard and so challenging that it's a miracle if you can graduate high school. And now I think they're just pushing people to go, oh, 90 some percent graduated high school so they can get more grant money. But, um, I mean, that's the truth of the matter, because um, it makes them look so bad. I'm the first and only person in my family to get a bachelor's degree. That was in 2008, taking on the procession, and I had worked all these minimum wage jobs, and that's what I had to do, and I did it. I've spent a lot of my life not having a car. I do have them now, um, <laughs> but it's uh, been a huge struggle. Um, so people said I would be the one to learn to solve these problems. I think like a detective. I ask a lot of questions. I do things. I talk about things that people don't want to talk about because we gotta figure this out. You know, I don't know if y'all know this or not. I don't know if anybody has been to McGill County, but it is the lowest part mm -hmm. of this state. You know, up here it's like you're on top of the mountain. Down there, you're down in the valley with all the mountains on top of you. 
and uh, you don't know what exists in the world. And it's almost like we have been, and I was telling my friends that live in Morgantown about this, just say this in last night, and we've been talking, you know, last night, this morning. Um, it's like, um, I figure the coal barons just made us so afraid to leave the haulers. Mm -hmm. And there's no interstate road that connects Mercer County to McDowell. So it has taken me so long to be able to get into a room like this because of like PTSD, all the anxiety, uh, feeling like, um, I don't feel like it's now, but feeling like I don't matter, like I'm less than, that I don't deserve, you know, things. Uh, I went to New York City twice when I was in high school. I was so scared. I mean, such a culture shock. I mean, I almost got left there. I mean, there's been people be mean to me, like, no matter what I've done. It's from where I'm from, my voice, red hair, I mean, you name it. It's like it's been stacked against me. But I'm pretty good at figuring out five or six different ways to make something work that other people cannot see. Um, with the creativity, that's what I'm good at. I'm a networker. I'll make things work that you never in your life would see something happen. Even if I can't see a way, I'll get in the middle of it and I will figure it out. Can I explain all the steps how to do that? Not really. But the relationships and the empathy, something the easiest thing for me to do is to relate to somebody. I don't even have to try to do that. And I was a baby born in an incubator for two months. Nobody could touch me or nothing. And so they say these babies that are born without touch and everything else, and that could be a reason why I had such anxiety starting out, they don't turn out real good. They're not empathetic. They're not loving. Well, I'm a pretty loving person, you know, I try to treat people how I want to be treated. And one of those things that I do is I will tell people whether they want to know it or not, what they need to know. And a lot of people will get mad at that at first, but I know what it's like to struggle and suffer and wish somebody had told me. So with creating, let me tell you what I can do besides all that. I can write songs. Um, I don't know all the notes that go to it, technically, but I can tell you how it sounds, I can sing it, I've probably written thousands by now, I mean, they just come to me, I can write stories, I can see the strengths, talents, and skills in other people. I spend five minutes with you, I go, oh, okay, you're good at this, you're good at that, are you working on this? You know, <laughs> like, and um, down where I'm at, I'm in Mercer County, my best friend, I'll show y'all a picture she drew of me. I was going to use it as my book cover, but she's got two kids, she's married, working at Pizza Hut, 50 hours a week, with all this stuff at the school. She is artistically talented in all kinds of ways that I'm not. She can draw, paint, take old broken pieces of wood, turn them into amazing works of art, furniture, sell them for $20 or $30, trying to help pay her electric bill, trying to buy food, draws everything at the schools. It's just going, just creative has community garden and has a garden like just doing all this stuff with like no money no technological training and i'm like well this is what i see for her uh, if and i've been showing her i can do this and i used to think i couldn't either you know <laughs> um, if she had a website where she could post her art and this stuff people like y'all or all around the world would be paying her a lot of money for her Appalachian art down there in McDowell County see a mama rocket, you know, <laughs> down there with hardly nothing but hopes and dreams and visions in her head that she is making come true. But with all that being said, the internet is so low down there. So when they see what I do, you've probably seen some of what I've done on my page. Mm -hmm. I am like a uh, networker, community organizer, I mean, it's like magic, and I do it, people, I make one post that doesn't even give all the details, here's an example, I talk about, and this is like not a topic everybody wants to talk about, but it's something that needs to be talked about, it's helped me grow a lot, and it's starting to help me heal, one of the things that happened to me when I was in junior high, is a group of kids helped me get on the school bus, and really tried to listen, so I made a post about it, so many people, males and females, are telling the stories now. And they were never able to talk about how they do sexual assaulted, sexual abuse. But what triggered this for me, I don't know what y'all think about Donald Trump, but this is just what I have put. November 13th, I made this post. The first reason why I'm against Donald Trump is he sexually harasses women. This man at the gym the next day sexually assaulted me. 
It's been a blessing because I had stuffed all this stuff down, had not talked about it, had been making it fit. Now I'm starting to recover from this, and all these other people who are in therapy that are actually addicted, I'm not, but they're helping me, and I'm helping them, and it's just this big old thing. So y'all didn't know me before this, so what I do on my page is I just tell the truth. And, and I'll talk about what's right and what's wrong and what we should do about it. I have about 4,600 people on my page, and since I started talking, these people gravitated to me. I ended up meeting Molly because I tweeted about um, <laughs> Whitney Cummings talking crap about West Virginia. <laughs> and I barely politely told her she didn't know what she was missing out on. She needed to read some books and come and meet some people. And, and that's how I got connected to her was through my Twitter. And I hadn't been doing big things on Twitter, but it's becoming pretty amazing. John Santa's following me now. I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> like, you know, like just because I'm opening my mouth. Yesterday I talked to some people at the beauty shop and I'm just doing it. I don't like doing it yet. Like y'all can't tell, but it's like pulling on my spine. Like it's not an easy thing to do. It may look like it is, but it's not yet. Uh, <laughs> I hope that it does get there. But I was talking about being sexually assaulted and things I'm having to try to do to help defend and protect myself. Because I see that if this man gets away with doing what he did to me, there's a whole, I call them archetype of people that thinks they're going to be able to do that too. And so I'm standing up for myself and doing whatever I can to try to prosecute this guy, which is also leading to people in the past that needed prosecutors who hurt me. And all these other women are going to end up, and males, are going to end up doing the same thing. So that's the kind of power we have. I told the ladies at Beauty Shop, well, I did not know this was powerful, and they're going, mm -hmm, yeah, and I'm like, okay, well, let's organize the women in the streets, tens of thousands, quit doing all this work, quit being the secretaries for the lawyers and the doctors, you know, that are mostly men, no offense, you know, and the women are killing themselves. We've then learned how to work, take care of the family, clean the house, pay all the bills, and do everything, and we're, like, getting treated the, like the worst. <laughs> so, Sabrina, this is, one, thank you for sharing your story. You're welcome. <laughs> as always. But two, you bring up something really important, and that is, what is a maker? So, you are a creator of lots of different things, and one of the reasons we bring together, and this is sometimes the uncomfortable thing about human-centered design, is that it flows, right? But one of the reasons we wanted to bring a diverse group of voices around this table to start a conversation that's ongoing, that Remake and WVU are, are leading about how you recognize making as, as an important, marketable thing, is we need to understand how people see themselves as makers and, and help other people, more people see themselves the way you see you. And so we're gonna go through a little maker's journey here, but I wanted to start by asking the question, like if, if I'm asking somebody, do you consider yourself a maker, what is a maker? And so Sabrina, I heard some things in your story. I heard influencer, kind of community organizer, influencing other people to take action, um, to take personal action or political or social action. I, we've heard around the room artists, lots of makers are artists. Um, I heard a lot just from you, solvers, like a maker, someone who can make a good pie, even though my pie was not that great from our first exercise, um, might also be able to solve another problem, sometimes very technical problems. Um, they're designers, they're storytellers, what else, when I say maker, Maggie, what's, what's a maker? Oh, with your mouth full, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I think mean, it can be anybody that creates something, whether that's like a solution to a problem, a website, a piece of design, music, any kind of sure. art, product, project. So any creator. Other definitions that you want to make sure you get on the board about what's a maker? I, my favorite is uh, who I am is a cheapskate. And so <laughs> I can make something that would cost me a whole lot of money, um, and I can make it for one-tenth that amount. Um, I'm going to call it self-sustainer, but I like cheapskate too. Yeah, someone who can well, take care of themselves. It's, yeah, it's resource poor, right? Resource so, poor, right. Um, so you're, you're a maker out of necessity. So those are survivors? talking about healing too. Like you become a maker and trying to navigate your own healing process. Mm -hmm. Not the same thing works for everyone. We're still like really beginner as far as assessing like trauma and ACEs and everything, mm -hmm. especially here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the programs, I was, my previous hat was a generation West Virginia that works with Central mm -hmm. Africa. Oh, great. Yeah. I thought I recognized you. So it was like a mixture <laughs> of all these reasons, I guess, on at this table. But 
we have now realized that like building a trauma-informed tech curriculum has been where we need to go with our programs. Mm -hmm. Because the people that are attracting, like getting attracted to that, like you said, they're hungry for career development, they're hungry for the different pieces of the program, not just like to code or to develop software, but they're hungry for all the other pieces. And then like most of the class is also dealing coming in with carrying everything that they're carrying. Mm -hmm. um, higher ed hasn't worked for them. Traditional like workplaces haven't worked for them um, for whatever reason. So I think the healing process makes you a baker, and we don't talk about that enough because it's a strength that we have in West Virginia. We just haven't tapped into it. Yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that you talked about trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, the trauma can make you creative because you're yeah. desperate. It doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's real. Can, yeah, what makes someone a maker? We're actually going to. It's gonna, what yeah. made me open my mouth six years ago, and that's how everything that's happened after I opened my mouth has come together. I'm like, what in the world? That's why I have this book now, Holler to the Hill. <laughs> I need to publish. I'm hoping to publish in January. That's one of my main reasons for being here. It's made me laugh and help me uh, figure that out. You know, I huh. like the questions you ask. Well, what is preventing you or slowing mm -hmm. down from this? I've had this book written for two years. Oh, that's well. That's the first part. Wow, I wish I could finish any book. Um, so when we talk about, you know, we've said lots of things that make a maker. And Stacey, I didn't want to leave you that's out. Right. I don't. I mean, I. I a lot of these are things that I would have said. I, I'll add tinkerer, people who make mm -hmm. things from scratch. Yeah. People who you know are able to you know find the raw materials and, and build things and have that kind of patience instilled in them to do to do that work. I like that word tinkerer. I think it also I love that gives word. like a it, it conveys like a, a love of craft too mm -hmm. and like a exploration, which yeah. I think is really important. Yeah, a craft person, a curious person. Um, Donna and, and Ani, I don't mean to ignore you either since I'm no, no. standing with my back to you. I'm more interested in what folks around the table have to say. I think this is great. I just always think it's, it's identifying a need or a want mm -hmm. and going forward. A person who connects the, the need and want to action, yeah. yep. right? That's, That's great. So lots of different kinds of ways to be a maker, which is great. We talked a lot this morning, and, and at some points, I'm sure some of you are thinking, why are we talking about this? We talked a lot about labor market data and post-secondary attainment data. And we talked about that because we need to talk about how people do all of these things, are all of these makers, and can survive, right? Can sustain themselves or a family. So a maker for pay, does that bother anybody? Like, should making for making, it should just be OK, or is it necessarily can it necessarily be a way to make income? Maker for pay, people comfortable I with that concept? Be. Yeah. And I think people are so talented in Appalachia here that we should expect people to pay for our work. I think we've been too grateful and humble mm -hmm. to not realize that what we have are amazing gifts and talents. But my best friend, she's been a recovered addict for. Um, at least five years now. So five years ago when I went to see her, it was during a hard time for me. I couldn't hardly talk. Um, I went to see her and she said, well, I figure my art is going to become famous after I die and I'm going to die young. So I got to hurry up and teach my kids everything so they know how to take care of themselves because I'm going to die young. I'm like, the devil is a liar. Like, <laughs> I need you to live. I can't do this by myself. And now she believes in herself and she's working, you know, she's working and trying to get better and trying to figure out ways where she's at to rise up. It's just taking time. Sure. I just feel like after my book is published, I will be able to pay all her bills and, <laughs> you know, help her create a website and help her learn how to use this technology that in my area we really haven't had access to. And I'll have y'all know I'm marrying a guy who got three bachelor's degrees at the same time, computer science, business management, and accounting. He used to think that he wasn't going to be able to help people. And in the last five years, he has um, worked at the nonprofit hospital in Russell County in the IT department, and he's responsible for everybody getting paid, and he's creating all this software and doing all this stuff for them, where he's not really paid his value either. And he's working all the time, get paid no overtime. So that's another thing. It's not that people aren't working, 
You know, you talk about the jobs. They're doing all kinds of work. They're just not really getting paid for it. That's a really important point. So I, I asked, like, why pay? So it's valuable both to the market and it's personally valuable. Um, it preserves culture. It changes culture. Um, good makers can create things that, that help us question things or expand opportunity. It connects generations. It contributes to the economy. It employs people. It improves and transcends technology. Um, good makers can be good designers of, of good consumer tech. Um, it requires resources. Really great. Thank you. Um, it requires resources that we have to pay people so that they can be makers if we want them to do all of these other things for us. Um, it develops skills, skills that give us a workforce and an economy that we want. So here in the last you know, 40 minutes or so we have together, I want to take some of these things we've talked about, um, some of the personal stories we've heard, because when Lisa developed the series, and I love it, it was all about connecting stories, connecting our humanities experiences and personal stories to action. And I want to walk a person through this. So let's just call this person, give me a name, give me a, a good regional name. Come up with an imaginary person. Louisa. Louisa, I love it. Okay, so we have Louisa. Let's assume first that Louisa has never heard the idea of maker. If you say, hey Louisa, are you a maker? She said, what's a maker? Um, what could we get Louisa to do through programs you know about, through ideas you have, to see herself as a maker? How do we get her to try making? You can, this is a personal, free-flowing, creative exercise. There's no wrong answer. <laughs> Louisa tries making. Well, to me, it, it, um, you're assuming that Louisa doesn't have a background. And so I think the first thing for me would be mm -hmm. to find out who she is, because there's probably something that she does already that makes her a maker that like she it. probably doesn't consider making. Um, How does she have that conversation, Chip? Well, I, I think it's... It's hard to have a conversation with yourself. So I mean, if you're yeah. conversing with her, um, you, you could sort of open up and find out more about her. Um, because if you find out who she is, um, you can find that that connection point to mm -hmm. the ways that she's created in her life. That's or, right. Um, I love I that. A similar. I had a similar question mm -hmm. that was bubbling. Like, why start with the word maker mm -hmm. or maker culture, which is an established male, mm -hmm. white, male dominated mm -hmm. culture uh -huh. that has co-opted the word mm -hmm. in the culture of people. Mm -hmm. So why are we starting with them instead of starting with people? I like the I like that idea. So is this the word? Is this do we are we trying to get people to fit into a construct that exists, mm -hmm. right? Or get people to see themselves as all of these things that you said made up a maker? That's a great question, Ani. So is this even the word? Is this the construct? I mean I have to tell you that my experience um, coming here a few years ago and never being in West Virginia, my first um, chore, my first task was we had a project at the place where I worked to create maker spaces at several locations in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. When went to Huntington and then we went further and further into the hills and hollers of West Virginia. And I realized that the further we got into the hills and hollers, the more that they were able to teach us about making. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's not called making, it's called life. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, they do it every day in order to survive um, and in order to do the things that they do. So for us, it was a, a you know, gut check. It's like, oh, we're coming in assuming we know things mm -hmm. and committing a suicide, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, and it's not that the phrase isn't highly marketable. It right. It's a foothold into a grander, greater, larger, whatever the word is, economy. Those are different things. Right? That is a great point. So one of the things that we talk about when we walk somebody through one of these scenarios is how does the community need to change for somebody to be able to, to be mobile and navigate it? Well, the community needs just, we have some assumptions to challenge. We have to change our language and our assumptions. We don't impose making, we learn from it. It exists, we find it, we discover it. Maybe we do leverage it, maybe we capitalize on it, right? So that's a really great question. So if, if we wanted Louisa to see herself to see opportunity in her traits and skill sets and background. Not to say, not to like sit down and say, plug into this, but we want her to see opportunities in what she is. I, I tried to write down some places, like where would she have the conversations that Chip's talking about? Maybe at the museum, maybe if I stop by an exhibit, maybe at the library, maybe at church, maybe at school. 
Are there, you all know the, the local context way better than I do. If I were around the region, if I'm in Pittsburgh, if I'm Louisa and I'm in Pittsburgh, if I'm Louisa and I'm in Wheeling, who, where, who even tells me to be curious about, yeah? I think Remake Learn. There go. I really do. I mean, that would be my go-to. Donna, you, you. <laughs> and I think that's a great point. And when I got out here and, and we got into this project and we learned everything that Remake does, no kidding. Like, that, that is quite a network. So knowing that, and for people, Ani and Donna, who aren't as familiar with Remake around the table, how would a person know to go like to the to the the remake days, the remake learning days? Where do, how do they connect to that? I mean, there's a lot of marketing. Yeah, right? marketing. I don't mm -hmm. underestimate the investment that we make into our communications, right? And it's good and it's bad. It means that the brand is really powerful, but it also means the brand overshadows things and projects, and so that's something that we have to be really careful and mindful about, which is why eating together is such an important practice in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Community building is such an important mm -hmm. practice in what we do so that when Donna so graciously says something like, it's Remake Learning, I can say, yes, Donna, because you are part, you are Remake Learning, and Chip is Remake Learning, and mm -hmm. Stacy and everyone around this table is and could be Remake Learning, and it's not about a team of six facilitators that right. does any of that work, we just push it up, right? Yeah. That's a great point. So we try, we can get, Louisa could have this conversation ostensibly because you've got a culture and an infrastructure that really builds it up. A challenging question, just as a person who doesn't live here. Who's, not, what would stop Louisa from connecting with y'all? What are the barriers? Are there any? Culture is a huge one. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Innovation and even equity cultures are still, have very real cultural boundaries that I think we need to be careful and aware of. Um, mm -hmm. And then knowing who to ask, who feel uncomfortable to ask them. Gatekeeping is mm -hmm. a very serious part of any sort of system. Mm -hmm. um, and then having something that's viable and tangible on the other side, right? Like networking is great. And I believe in it. It's my work. It's my life work. But if you don't naturally have networking skills, I don't necessarily have the coaching capability to teach you how to do it, right? Right. And that's a big flaw in the system as well, if we're going to be open and honest about what those challenges are. There are logistics challenges too, especially yeah. in like Southern West Virginia. Like, you know, I think about the women that we work with, a lot of them, we had open houses and things, and very few of them actually came to an open house, but, you know, they don't have time. Like when they're looking for flexible mm -hmm. options, they don't have time to like fit a schedule find childcare, show up to the thing. Right. So trying to find a way to make things more self, or more flexible and, and um, accessible. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, how do you reach classroom teachers when lunches are during the day mm -hmm. and then they have to go home and tend to their lives mm -hmm. and their unions tell them that they can't any other time. So if anyone has an answer to that one, you know, let them. <laughs> All ears. That's a great question. Yeah. So uh, you've highlighted a, a category of things that would need to be different mm -hmm. to grow someone's capacity to see themselves this way. And every time, this is actually why we stop doing kind of pure automation conversations because the answer is always the same. Yeah. We build a million programs. There's no bus system. We built a million programs. There's no third shift childcare. We built a million <laughs> programs, and. Um, people who have the least money have the least time. And so these are really important logistical questions and when you're doing your outreach and programming for makers, um, time, transit, childcare cost, work around schedules, um, even their, their work identity. So if they're a teacher, they also have, they're being asked to be 40 different things to people all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so those are really important. So Molly, this is why I love these, they flow. Yes, Sabrina. Uh -huh. So back here, how you get Melissa to say she's a maker, mm -hmm. it's important to ask people what are your favorite things to do and what mm -hmm. you love to do. She was, see, a lot uh, yeah. of people love to do their favorite things, but they don't know they can make money doing it. Um, and then the two, you, you, missed, you touched on transportation, but like not everybody, the bus may not even go there, they don't have a car. Mm -hmm. The number one uh, barrier that I have seen being a person who came from where I did and had the education that I had that most people around me don't have 
is the professional lingo. So, oh, yeah. yeah. People hear my hick accent and hear how I talk, and they think I don't understand everything they're saying, but I do. I want to make sure the people who don't have the education know what the heck is going on. And I, I stopped using that professional lingo six years ago. Because I started saying, well, they think I think I'm better than them. They don't know what I'm saying. Like, for example, a couple of ladies from Bernie Sanders' office came to McDowell County, and they were some people I know. And they were like, oh, my gosh, you're having grandma seizures, and you don't have to have insurance. You can get that through the marketplace. And she's standing there looking at them. I call her mom. I'm like, mom doesn't know what you're talking about. That sounds like a place to go get groceries. You know, <laughs> she can't get online right. and go and try to sign up for this marketplace because when it rains, she loses phone connection and she doesn't have internet. So <laughs> we're in McDowell County here. Like, this is, like, impossible for the people who live here to go by that system. That's a great point. So that's a that's a count under logistics, kind of broadband infrastructure network activity, but also social capital. So whether it's higher education attainment or understanding you could be a maker or finding the people ultimately if we went through a scenario that took her into business or entrepreneurship, who's going to buy her stuff? Right. And who's going to think it's interesting? Um, so in terms of social capital, what exists? <coughs> Donna, if you could build a magic wand and create like a social capital making machine for the people in this region, what would it look like? You know, I, I think it's things that have already been touched on, mm -hmm. with the networking and those kinds of things, you know, being able to communicate, that's the key to it. Mm -hmm. And when we are going back to remake learning, what would prevent you from knowing about remake learning, I think it's lack of social capital and the fact that, you know, they might not have heard of it. And then when they hear of it, it's touchy-feely in a way, sort of like, you know, public mm -hmm. education collaborative is, and people are like, <laughs> what is it? Just right. like maker. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does that even mean? Like, right. we love the idea of a maker culture and a maker space, and it's it's a great economic answer based on what we talked about this morning. But maybe we don't call it that. That might be a real boon. So one of the things that you mentioned um, social capital and networking. One of the things we talked about recently in Northern Indiana to entrepreneurs of color to answer this question was what's a simple thing we could all do? And one thing we all agreed to do is the next time we get invited someplace. We take two people with us that don't look like us, which can sound like a goofy um, navel-gazing exercise, but in a small enough place like South Bend, Indiana, to be invited to some fundraiser, and if I'm a white woman, to take a black woman with me and a Latino man might actually expand their network, but I'm going to have to write some blank checks. And it's still not a simple answer because how do you know where to find people who don't look like you? We all tend to hang out with people who look like us. Um, so. One of the other things you've mentioned a lot is communication, getting rid of the jargon. How much val is there value, as people around this table think about how to kind of expand your own programs and your own networks, in either telling people, listen, stop using the jargon, or do you train people to start using the jargon? Like, do you do right. both? You should. I don't think you should, too. Yeah? yeah. So come it's at it both so ways? It's so easier to connect with somebody. If you notice, like, if you're around Mom and Paul, and let me tell you, Mom and Paul, used to race horses and have horse shows and they're in a lot of the videos I'm in and people look at them and just judge them like they kick up cans off the side of the road, they just like metal, they're constantly busy and if you see the things that Ma designs in her yard like she puts goldfish in our pond and you know she's got a little fisherman in there and I'm just like this is awesome, they're, they're creating stuff and me I'm so busy like on this other level that I'm not even thinking about how I can create stuff like that. But, um, I'm sorry I can't remember what I started out, oh Mom and Paul. Jargon. Jargon. So if you go in there and you don't say any words that relate to them, you, you can't help them because there's no human connection. I think it's important to mention too that mom and pa have their own jargon that we should learn. Mm -hmm. and Two way learning. It's sure. A conversation, right? Like, I have an uncle who's a cattle farmer and a gardener who I'm obsessed with, and I don't think he understands why I like him so much, but I'm like, <laughs> you have all of this knowledge, yeah. and <laughs> no one else does. Like, I need to absorb this from you. Like, mm -hmm. tell me everything. And um, he humors me. <laughs> and then well, I go back to Pittsburgh and he's like, I'm back to the city. <laughs> and there are people who don't want to make you feel bad, so they're very funny, they're uplifting, mm -hmm. they can tell lots of jokes, they make you feel good. 
You know, there's some people that have helped me do what I'm doing. They're like, I see a silver lining over you. And they have a lot of Native American heritage. So they'll speak in those kind of terms, which some people will think they're crazy or whatever, but they're, it's still parts of the culture that's still there, even though it's like basically been destroyed or obliterated from that area. Stacey, that is really interesting, and Sabrina, you've doubled down on it, the two-way language learning, so what, what do we expect people to understand? In the past, and think tanks are very guilty of this, so like I'll, I'll out New America, right? You do journalism around something. You say, here is a story about a person from West Virginia who blows glass. Isn't that interesting? Listen to how they talk. Um, but it can be like parachute journalism, right? Very outsider, kind of fetishizes these fascinating people versus saying there's something you should take from this and you should change your behavior. Does anybody, because we can solve this, we can leave this room and say we did something amazing. Does anybody have an idea about how you get away from like icky, fetishized, rural tourism journalism and into a way that, that translates it? Commission people from here to write it. Commission local writers, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. um, like all due respect to outside think tanks, but there's yep. plenty of West Virginia equipment to write articles. That's exactly right. So commission yeah. local journalists. Bring them into your world. That two-way language learning is important. And Stacy, you had something to add? Yeah, I think it's like a core principle of this. Like, I think understanding that tech is not just software application development, that like glass blowing is technology. Like mm -hmm. that fork we all used for our salads at lunch was technology. And at one time it was like the most, <laughs> the, you know, the newest technology. Mm -hmm. But like every everything has been innovated from something else, and there's still people innovating in the glass blowing industry. Like there's still technology to be understood and learned there. That's you know, article science. It's you know, it's all different, all the different spectrums of engineering, material, you know, chemical, mechanical. Like it's all interwoven, and that goes into like the home chef who's making a pumpkin pie in their kitchen, to like the artist who's mixing pigments. Like it's, it's embedded in all of it it's all technology and i think making that less scary and understanding that like me as somebody who has a fine arts background i now work with a whole bunch of engineering phds like i still play like i still like come to work every day and i keep up with those people mm -hmm. um you know and not like not in spite of my background but like because of it like we all have something to give it goes back to the two-way communication thing too and the general respect and um you know thinking being empathetical to other mm -hmm. people but i think like d stigmatizing the technology in general as a word is important. I think there's an old saying that some, some things are new because they're not good enough to be old. And <laughs> old, old technologies are, are really uh, phenomenal. Totally. Um, and if you learn how to use old technologies, it's as valuable sometimes as learning a new technology um, can be. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's another thing that I would sort of um, underscore, and that is that maybe one way to to really get underneath this is if you're going to work with a community, pull a self-organized subset of that community together and do exactly this, gather around the table and ask just a simple question, which is, what are your aspirations for your community? And then shut up yep. and let them talk. Um, and they'll probably tell you four or five things that you should do for them. Um, but if you just go back and see, but let's go back to that original question. What are your aspirations for your community? Well, what do you mean by my community? Well, what do you mean by your community? Just keep um, really listening hard and actively to what what they say. Um, you may uncover some, um, one, some, some of their assets uh, that they have, but then also tap into um, a very deep uh, set of um, wants and needs mm -hmm. um, that you, you wouldn't know otherwise, um, that you go in and assume, oh, well, what we need is more infrastructure and you need this and maybe university, or you can create all sorts of um, solutions to problems that may not exist, mm -hmm. but if you can actually tap the strengths and the assets that are there in the community first, yeah. um, then you find mm -hmm. interplays in ways that a network um, could actually help. Because mm -hmm. no one single organization or one single person has all the answers. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be it has to come from the community that you want to help and based on what their aspirations are. And then maybe we want a better life for our kids. Great. Um, let's talk about that. And get into the like, five like? whys mm -hmm. deep. You know, yeah. well, why is that? Well, why is that? Well, why mm -hmm. is that? Um, and really do and really look for those assets that exist because they do exist in, in all these communities.
Um, and then finding that as a stepping stone to build out from that. That, Body language yeah. is so key in facilitating that well, right? Mm -hmm. like, don't smile too much. Don't be too bombat. Like, just shut relax. up. Is another just shut up and listen. Yeah. Can I interject and add something to that? Please. So right there's out. been organizations and uh, nonprofits and people over the past six years come to McDowell County and ask these questions. What are your dreams? What would you do if you had the money? And they go and create these programs where people who don't live there get to be the bosses, and mm -hmm. they want all the people down there to not get paid yeah. and be a part of all their meetings and their groups. And the people are so, they're doing everything they can to survive. Then they come to these meetings, and they put everything there, and then the people, it's like they take and they they don't give nothing back. Mm -hmm. Which is directly <laughs> the case. Right. Yeah. That's exactly that's what's right. Going on. Somebody from the outside coming that's in right. and telling you. And me here, I'm gonna bring these people in, get everybody mm -hmm. there, just so they can see what's happening at the meeting. Like, look what these people get to do. Why don't we try to do this? Okay, well, how do we get the money? We have to take what we can do, create something, and sell it. So we can. That's why I come with my books, my albums. I know I can make shows. I just don't know how to record this stuff myself. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I've been in documentary, so I'm like having to figure out how to do all this stuff from underground. That's what I call it. They say on the ground. I'm like, I'm down here. I don't just want to be here. I want us all to go up here. So <laughs> I'm having to figure all this out. So anyway, that's that's what's been going on. Um, one of the things, though, people who haven't been asked, what are your dreams? And I've been asking the younger people, what are your dreams? And they're like, what do you mean? What I dream of at night? I'm like, well, if it's a good dream, yeah. But <laughs> look back on your life and look back when you were a kid. What did you hope for? Like, if your dreams were to come true, what would that look like? And so I'm trying to get them to write those down. Because if we could tell other people what our visions are, and our dreams, I mean, for me, when I was five years old, I mean, I started a lot in my life. Uh, I didn't know how to put this in words, but it'd be community gardens everywhere. Well, you got people coming from West Virginia State University telling you you gotta spend $30 on a pot to <laughs> put this stuff, if the pot ain't there, and you gotta go to another county to buy the pot to put seeds in it to grow it. They're like, whatever, we're gonna just grow it in the ground where we're at, which may have poison in it. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we're at. Nobody's mm -hmm. coming in and just saying, oh, well, this is the solution. Let's right. fix this up. Let's do this. Let's give you what you need. You can do it yourself after we show you what to do. Everybody wants pay. <laughs> so right, right. It's a business model. Who sure. want to help wants pay. And I'm not against them being paid, but it's like a, been a one sided thing. Yeah, I mean, you, you're, you're raising a really important question. The most important question is don't ask a question that you don't mean to act on the answer to, right? Like you, you've got to listen to people and you've got to vest the authority and the money in the locals. Um, and so when you're thinking about how not to be a, oh please. Can I add one more yeah, thing? please. This is something I've been thinking about with people saying they want to help McDowell County. I think they need to go and live there for one month. Not a week, mm -hmm. not a day, one month. And you can bring all of your money and your cars and all your phones and everything. And I want to see you go down there and live for one month. You gotta go in and I'll even introduce you to some people. And then you go and see how it is. Cause you just, you can watch a video or whatever. You can stay the night with somebody and everybody is gonna treat you probably the best you've ever been treated in your life. No matter how you treat them. They're gonna treat you good. Then you're gonna see. You know, Rockefeller went down there, and he's like, oh, I was a Vista. Yeah, you should have poured billions of dollars into McDowell County sure. or wherever else you went. But you didn't. We got Head Start, which I'm grateful for. But, hey, we needed more than Head Start, and we need more than that. And they're taking all that away now. So, you know, like, we got to do something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got to do something different and do something better. So that that's what I'm thinking. So the next time some politician says they want to help, I'll be like, y'all need to come down here and live for a month. You can have all your staff members and everything wait on you, but come down here and see how the system is. Because how I feel is if we don't start helping places like McDowell County, the rest of the world is already going in that direction. This will be like the best pilot program. People will say, oh, let's just do North Fork. No, there's 18,000 people there. Six years ago, there was 22,000 people. So about 4,000 people died. These are people I grew up with that I love, and they're gone. And <laughs> the people around me are dying. So why couldn't we do a pilot project in McDowell County? and help them be the maker. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I think that's exactly it. So one of the one of the things when and it's not lost on me, right? The New America is in D.C., right? And that I'm here because I'm from West Virginia. And I said, I think we should do something in West Virginia. But I shouldn't be the one to do the thing, right, for the reasons that we've talked about. But what I can do, and what I think New America wants to do, is get these messages in front of the people who, who are often looking for ways to spend their money, right? Well, how do we spend money? What do we do? Can we have a fellowship program? And so the fellowship yeah. program leapt out at me. And whether that is a fellowship for makers or leaders. We're not the only one in the state. So talk to me about, and that's, and I've heard well, Generation West Virginia, right? Sarah was a fellow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. What's your name? Kinsey Walker. What did, what did that fellowship program need from the outside world, right? From looky loos that it didn't get. Was it money? Oftentimes, um, what often else did you need? It's like the employer partnership. So like okay. every employer, because a lot of what we were talking about is like, yeah, it's great to create like skill building exercises, but a lot of those don't work because they're just like, oh, here's your skills. Good luck getting a job. Um, so a lot of it is the employer partners are all in different industries, and even two that are in the same industry have a totally different hiring process. Sure. Um, so navigating actually educating companies on hiring and expediting that for certain professions that get hired sooner, and companies that will take the top graduates at WVU and ship them to Pittsburgh or ship them somewhere else because they're able to hire quicker. Um, that was one of the biggest barriers I ran into on like the behind the scenes part of this program mm -hmm. is that we were losing our best and brightest because we weren't as nimble as other hiring. And there are great models places. like Connellsville, so yeah. industry, which is a great yeah. model of industry to react yeah. to. So that was the goal of the program was to be a better connector between like what's actually available in the job market and then what skill sets folks that want to live here have. Totally. And then supporting them through the full year of the fellowship with the transition into a new place, even if they're from West Virginia, they might be from Charleston and living in Parkersburg. Mm -hmm. If they're not from West Virginia, half of the most recent cohort were transplants. They've never been from work. So helping them navigate that through the other West Virginians and not them thinking if they're coming to save the community due right. to their volunteer hours is really important. Mm -hmm. um, the fellowship is designed to be a year long. It's four days of work on volunteer Friday every Friday. So you are getting immersed in the community and they are the experts guiding you through your volunteer process. They get matched with the volunteer Friday. Um, and Sarah was actually there before I was even hired. She was the first co that went through the program. Um, so her experience. Like, was that through Generation West Virginia? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, as a, as a fellow in the program, when you were looking around at the resources you had and the experience you were having, and clearly you're a great leader and it's made you an even better leader and you're here and we're grateful, what would you have added? Like if you could have just put a wish list in the mailbox and gotten something back? More money, more fellows, more community, more... What did you want? You mean, as a fellow on the ground? Yeah, as a fellow, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Not because of the quality of the program, but because of the community and and honestly, people like us, right? Like the, the nonprofit kind of industrial complex that looks around and says, oh, what do we do? Like, what do you need? Hmm, good question. I, I actually really appreciated the fact that, I mean, while well, there was outside funding came in to help support the initial infrastructure, um, it's actually a pretty self-sustaining or like with it sustained within the state and that companies pay for it, which mm -hmm. is something that, uh, you know, I like the fact that it doesn't necessarily have to go, I mean, not that they don't need outside grants to sustain other bigger yeah, other pieces and the, of the organization, the organization yeah. itself, yeah. but um, the fact that they're looking within the state and not seeking someone outside yeah. to come. Can I ask the question in a different so way? What would you like? How would you like to see more people benefit? Uh, Is it possible? Like, how would that be possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, more more spots, mm -hmm. more spots, more spots. The, the beauty, the beauty okay, the beauty of that, program that increases the numbers. It, shedding light on the fact that there's this huge gap here. There are young people who really want to stay but feel like they don't have any opportunity, and then mm -hmm. there are companies all across the state that need. People, they need bodies, they have jobs, mm -hmm. and they say, we just can't find anyone good. And I see, in my work, I see this all the time across mm -hmm. all kinds of different industries in the state. There's this huge gap, and it's because 
there wasn't a matchmaker. And yeah. so this fellowship is the first uh, entity stepping into the space yeah. and saying, like, let's do the connecting. And, uh, you know, you might not be able to stay in your same community, but within the state, there yeah. is, like, showing there is a ton of opportunity that often goes under the radar because just the, the people aren't talking to each other. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it helps reveal sort of the hidden infrastructure mm -hmm. of these industries. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Hearing. Just what jobs are even available? Like, industries yeah. don't post their jobs. Like, there's yeah. so many employers instance, that don't post their jobs. For instance, I know I, I have friends who. It's a simple thing, but it's real. Are like, native West Virginians who say, who is an architect? And she says, oh, I'd love to come back and live in West Virginia, but I just can't get a job as an architect in West Virginia. Not true. Right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we have two. And, yeah. Last year. And you could say that for any industry, mm -hmm. that yeah. young people just don't necessarily see the opportunity here. Yeah. When it's there, they're just not connected to it. Well, there is a, there, I'm, I've been seeing posts about guys in Gal County talking about how they went and got the coal training, there's the coal jobs, and they're exactly. getting the jobs, mm -hmm. and they're saying, mm -hmm. I'll work a whole first month for free, mm -hmm. and they're still not hiring. Mm -hmm. They're showing up, they're not, they're not hiring. And they say, you got to be somebody's relative mm -hmm. or somebody's friend. You're always gonna and they're like that. desperate and have a job. they got a wife and kids, and they, they don't know what to do. Sure. So like I'm trying not to do anything wrong here. And they're basically like, I might have to start selling drugs. I mean, <laughs> like, I mean, they're like really desperate. So there are a couple of things at play in what just came up. One is pulling the curtain back on kind of the industry infrastructure, the insider industry stuff. You know, we do some work with, with burning glass. Y'all have people locally who do it. Like, who can tell you when jobs aren't being posted, why? Like, what's out there? even outside of what's available in you know, what a, an aggregator or crawler can tell you. Um, but the need to kind of just return local money to local efforts, when people ask what they can do, putting their pressure and using their social capital on employers seems like a big one to create more spots, to start helping employers see the talent argument, which is a great role, and I know it's a role that WVU plays, mm -hmm. is saying you, we have talent in this state mm -hmm. that we can credential and certify in different ways. The talent is here. You have an obligation to ask the employers to start doing some mm -hmm. lift I'll here, like <laughs> right? I will say also kind of tangentially related to this, um, some of the work I've done with the Tamarack Foundation for the Arts, which uh -huh. is a statewide um, nonprofit that helps boost the capacity of artists. Again, this is another industry where I see the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. There are artists at retirement age who have made a successful business for themselves, who now are at the point they're getting they're ready to retire. They don't necessarily have someone to take over their business, if it's a woodworking business, or you know someone to learn the ropes. They'd be willing to take on apprentices, but they don't know anyone in their community who, you know, they don't. And then, the flip side of the coin is there are young people all across the state who are saying, man, uh, I would love to be an artist, but there's just no, I can't do that here. Mm -hmm. um, because they don't know those other people. So again, you need someone you know, have to fill that void and say, oh no, like, yeah, it might not be in your exact community, but mm -hmm. did you know there's a woodworker in the two counties over? Mm -hmm. and, uh, or a glass blower, or a fiber artist, or you, know, mm -hmm. you name it. Yeah, it's... Yeah. We have a hope issue here. Mm -hmm. And I think that people, I, I have this argument with my boss, like, He's like, we just need to create jobs. I'm like, yeah, we do. But if we don't address the trauma, if we don't address the mm -hmm. centuries of disappointment mm -hmm. and like make people believe again, they're just gonna say, they're gonna shrug their shoulders and say, I can't do that here, or it's not gonna work. Or I do what I do. It's, you know, there's <laughs> a lot of away. fear. And there's also a lot of fear, I think, because of like the scarcity that a lot of people have grown up with. Like we have a mindset problem mm -hmm. where people are really risk avoidant. Mm -hmm. um, and that's hindering entrepreneurship, that's hindering innovation because they're not willing to take a chance. And they don't have any safety nets. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really hard to ask somebody who doesn't have any money to take a chance. And so I think if we were gonna to try to apply some sort of um, assistance. We do transitional funding. Yeah, and, but I think almost having like yeah. incubators yep. for more creative yep. companies, mm -hmm. like you would for a tech company, yep. would be one of the are there creative, uh, there, there are in a lot of ways, so I, I want to make sure that I'm not stepping all over something. What, who are the creative incubators here? Like, where do those, I, I think of Remake is one. There's the um, Robert C. Institute. Oh, sure, yeah. They were actually going to be here today, so that's a good one. So, 
RCB Eye is a good incubator. Other incubators that I you think? I haven't seen anything come out of this. I mean, maybe I'm not connected as well, but there's something at Woodville State that's supposed to be like a think tank that's supposed to help people start businesses and stuff. I mean, it's the county I live in, but I don't really need much. Okay. Yeah, there's uh, the Hive in Beckley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, Hive in Beckley. These, most of our state colleges have smaller programs that are, you know, yeah. working in this sphere. Um, there are artist residency programs, like mm -hmm. youth parks and conservancy and many other artist residencies. But like if you want to go back to like when bakers were studio artists, like yeah. there's a whole, you know, infrastructure of, of things that um, connected those people with resources. Um, but I do want to speak to what you said about trauma for a second because I think that something you said about being like made me think of like how you have to be so fanatical about what you're making to be a good maker, mm -hmm. to like rise above the others and actually have a self-sustaining business. Like you basically have to be obsessive. Like you have to be kind of an obsessive tinker. But to go from someone who is coming from trauma to get to that level is such a far, such a far stretch. Um, and I think the more intermediary things like incubators, whatever else, can be put in between is helpful, but it is so, such a far stretch. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we do the best job either at celebrating the successes because, you know, there's that psychological stat that like for every negative thing, you have to hear six positive things to offset it. And think about like, I think we do celebrate successes here, but we've got to do it at such a bigger level because from the outside in, everybody's, we're definitely the underdog. And you know, all you hear are mm -hmm. negative stories coming from here. And so if you're trying to magnify the positive by six times, we almost need to be obsessive about being like, look, this person does this, they succeeded, they overcame this, so that you start to believe that you can make that leap. Um, we were talking about being like liaisons to connect people, but number one, what this area needs, is that where I'm at, is mentors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're talking about languages and everything. Like, I'm being a mentor to everybody. Everywhere I go, even people I don't know. Oh, do you know about this? You know about that? Like, what you're saying? I'm like, I'm trying to tell them everything I learned. You know, <laughs> like, because, and my husband says, you'll help, you'll help every person you meet, even if you decided to work at Bob Evans the rest of your life. You know, <laughs> you'll come in there and be like, well, let me tell you what you need to do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I do, I, I, I do want to notice that we're at time, and I know people have places to be. Um, feel free to hang out and keep talking and keep telling me things because this is incredibly helpful. But I wanted to say a couple things in closing. One is this was meant to be kind of a first intimate salon to help connect some people who maybe aren't talking, although a lot of you are, but also to help me make some decisions, if I'm being honest. So I've got some regranting that I need to do, and, I've, and I'm doing it in West Virginia, and I'm trying to figure out where is a good investment, um, and I think I've got some ideas. But I also am trying to offer New America's um, tech and journalism platform in a new way to support some of the work that you've talked about today. So are there stories that you want told by a local journalist, right, that we could promote, publish, and push out there? What would be a smart way to do that? We don't have to do it, right? You know, it's just New America has this platform. We'd be happy to use it for this. But I, I would kind of defer to the community about whether or not that's the right move. And I don't think one lunch is, is enough to get there. Another purpose of today is to kind of tee up another conversation that's happening in the region, um, courtesy of Remake and WVU, around makers getting their due, kind of in terms of certifications and credentials and currency. Um, and so I wanted to start this conversation so I could plug into that and get, get my feet under me before I, I participate with those folks. Um, but also in closing, I just want to Thank you a lot. It is, it is a weird thing to come to a table with a random think tank and a random woman, West Virginian though she may be, and share your personal stories and try and help her and us understand whether this is a thing we should chase, right? I'm having this conversation in other states about craft manufacturing economies and what it looks like in different places. And of all the places I wanted to make sure we're in that network, we wanted to make sure West Virginia was one of them if it's appropriate. Um, so feel free to hang out and keep talking, but I know lots of people have to, to hit the road and have places to be. I would love to hear back from you face-to-face, one-on-one, this was a waste, this was great, or I'd like to have another conversation. And I'd like to have a conversation with these people, right? Because my network, uh, you know, I, I did live here a long time, but I've lived in Indy for 20 years. And my network isn't what it used to be. So I need your help in figuring out if you have more chances like this, what should they look like? 
Um, but open the floor for, for gut reactions or, or parting words. Donna. I, I love this. I think it's phenomenal. And you're a great facilitator, by the way. But one thing that keeps eating at me, mm -hmm. and it's just my own personal thing, is a, being a classroom teacher for 24 years. I'm just wondering what we can do to get students, you know, to mm -hmm. this level. You know, what, you know, it almost sounds like you all were born with the, no. the gifts that you have, but I know that's not true. And uh, as a teacher, <laughs> it's hard to teach I those things, I I, even though I like to think I did some version of it in my classroom. But I, I don't know if that's part of what you do, Molly, or what you think about, or if that's something we're going to do with the pre-service part. But it just somehow, you know, I'd love to just talk more about it. Yeah, that's self-identity. Instead of connecting younger kids and show them they can do that. So that way they're working on their hopes and dreams while they're a kid and not 29 years old and realizing they went by the world system like I did and it ain't working out. You know, like it didn't matter how smart I was, how nice I was, how if, if I did everything the same way they taught me to do, I wasn't ever going to succeed. And that resonates, and then too, when they were talking about coding, that coding's not important, it's the thinking behind it. How yeah. do we get kids to that level? Because they're not born that way usually. <laughs> yeah, I have to think like that. That is a, that's a great point. So I've got a lot of parking lot issues. Um, it is my favorite thing when these sessions don't follow the map, because those are always the best ones. I'm going to try and capture this in a narrative way and feed it back to you. And some of those will be parking lot questions, especially for future conversations. There is a future conversation. I believe we've picked the date, January 28th. I tell you, but it's a busy group, so we've got it. Yeah, to pick that back up. Any other um, parting shots, parting questions? Yes. Do you think other people should be at this table? So let me know. And we can convene any group you want. We can also have a different host for conveners. Right? New America is always happy to call by the pizza. We don't have to be the full season. So let me know what you think. Like you could have. If somebody else's resources could be spent yeah. so that you could throw something like this, there's a statewide yeah. yeah. There's like yeah. other people that I think like have great insight. Absolutely. Not that are still on the ground that would be helpful. Awesome. And you know, Donna, I think um, we don't get asked about our hopes and dreams and what are our favorite things to do. And there's not any kind of like test to access what we're really good at. So you know, things that we're good at makes us happy. Yeah. And so if we can much. help it's other people really, really with it, that makes us happy so too. Much, but we need to also think about helping ourselves and because yeah. we were not yeah. taught yeah. you know, yeah. just yeah. to help everybody else and not yourself. Yeah. So the past six years, that's what I've been having to learn, is how do I help myself? How do I love myself? I've been loving shut, everybody shut, else, shut, 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 and I'm yeah. empty, and how do I do it? Well, how I've been climbing out of a hole, and I'm out of it. I feel like I'm yeah, in and I appreciate it. It's been real uncomfortable, and I'm in trying to pop my head out of it, and I feel like I've got my head like cracked to the top of the cocoon. Yeah, so I'm still not out of it. To so everybody else, it looks like I'm flying. Um, I don't know how I feel or what I'm having to try to figure out to be in this world where you be the change you wish to see in the world. I stuck in kindergarten and I've got a little job and so there were certain things that teachers did that were good and helped me. You know, how many of you have been out of grade? I was like, no. And so I did, but, but then my school shut down. I got separated yeah, like from everybody. Shit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, but stuff kept happening. So I had to figure out ways to make it work because I'm going to be the one. You know, the dream that you had that goal, that's what resonated. It was deeply planted into me. My mom said, you're better and so much regretted. So I'm going to be the one. And 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 I'm going to be the one.